Hello and welcome back to another episode of Nature's A Hoot with me, Tom. And me, Hannah. For our main feature this month, we'll be hearing from an inspiring young conservationist who is making waves in the birding world. Tom will be chatting to him later. But first, we wanted to touch on our big story for this month, um, something that I know hit me pretty hard, and I'm sure it might have done so with some of our listeners as well. Hannah, you watched the Extinction programme on the BBC this month as well, didn't you? Yes, I did. So Extinction, the facts, which brought our wonderful, well-loved David Attenborough back to the screen um, to talk a bit about extinction, really, um, and the impact that humans are having on the planet. Uh, the programme was really good, I thought, and positive to watch, um, really touched on some important content and some important topics that I think everybody really needs to face up to, but also quite upsetting, um, a little bit depressing in places. What did yeah, you think? I definitely found the same thing. When you said it was quite positive, <laughs> I thought, <laughs> was it? <laughs> because I, I mean, I... positive that they're making a programme like oh, that, yeah, for positive sure. that it's... they're touching on these topics. It's what we should be talking about every day, isn't it? I mean, yeah. there's there's so much within that programme, so many times where I just thought, God, we're really horrible, aren't we? As it's a really bad, um, unfortunately. I pulled a few sort of, um, of the key uh, messages out of the programme just to share with everyone. So extinction is now happening at a rate 100 times faster than the national, a natural evolutionary rate. So that means it's going at a rate 100 times faster than it would be if humans weren't having any impact on the planet. So that's huge. We're actually now in the sixth mass extinction. Um, As one of the scientists in the programme said, we are the asteroid. So like the asteroid that uh, destroyed the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, we are now having that same impact. Mm. I think it's interesting actually in the programme that they took the time to say that extinction is an entirely natural thing to happen. Like the extinction isn't necessarily in natural terms a bad thing. It's part of the natural kind of cycle of our planet, the cycle of the different um, areas of biodiversity around the world. It kind of has to happen. But the issue is the speed at which it's happening exactly. and the different places it's happening around the world. So it's happening in, in the Amazon rainforest and in the, the Arctic Circle. It's happening right, uh, right around the world. Really the everywhere. Time. Yeah, <laughs> nowhere, nowhere is safe. safe. Um, and something that I think was important that they touched upon as well is that we're not just losing things that are nice to look at. We're not just losing fluffy animals and nice tigers and things like that that we like looking at and we like appreciating we're actually losing the benefits that nature provides to us as a species so it affects our food availability it affects the climate as we know massively affects um climate change is having a huge impact on the planet and that is all the impact of humans something great to reflect on is this idea that so often when we're talking about extinction and, and endangered species as a collection at the trust i think quite often people don't realize how important all of these animals really are so so often as you've said you know a, a panda or a tiger or any of those animals that are kind of famously in decline get a lot of attention I think people's first thought is, oh, it'd be really sad if we couldn't see them in the wild again. And that's absolutely true. And it's a very fair thought to have. Um, but I think it takes a little bit more thought to kind of understand that really it's it's not just something that's nice to have. We're not just going to not have something great to look at, this beautiful biodiversity. We're going to, well, it's completely breaking down the whole whole ecosystems that they're part of. Exactly. Um, Particularly when you think about food availability and crops, um, one of the things we're having a massive impact on is pollinators. And we need pollinators to pollinate our food. We literally can't live without them. Um, And pollinators are in huge decline. If we lose them, then we're in very big trouble. Something that really struck me, actually, when we we're talking about production of food, um, was the this kind of percentage of the biomass of the different animals living on, on the planet. And I just picked up on this one thing, and I, I took a picture of the screen, so I need to remember this, um, that 60% of the biomass on Earth is taken up by livestock, the, the animals that we farm, 36% by human beings, and 4% 
by wild animals. And that, I just couldn't believe that. Four percent is wildlife. Um, and how quickly that must have changed, really, in the in the natural history of planet Earth. How quickly has it gone from pretty much all wildlife, including ourselves, to we've completely changed the face of the planet, haven't we? On that topic, with population, that was something else that they did talk about, which I thought was really interesting, is a lot of people want to sort of place the blame somewhere and it's very easy to say you know people in developing countries have a lot of children and this is a problem and population is booming and it's out of control which is true population is a massive issue the population of humans is accelerating alongside biodiversity loss but we do have to think that the other major problem arguably a bigger problem is consumption so if you're thinking about the average american compared to, say, the average Tanzanian, uh, that American is probably going to be consuming hundreds of times more than the average rural African, for example. Um, And this is something we really need to think about and have to be aware of, is it's really consumption in Western countries that's causing much of the impact. And I I think it was quoted as a million species threatened with extinction. Yeah, a million. So there are about eight million in total and one million of those so that's quite a lot more than 10 percent something like 12 percent of species are threatened with extinction and that means that they are classed as um vulnerable um but there was a kind of a little bit of positive in there wasn't there um i know um david attenborough quite famously went to uh rwanda to research and and kind of document the last really surviving yeah. mountain gorillas and we kind of took a look back at that footage from from the original documentary and then kind of seen where those individuals are now and some of the individuals that David Attenborough met are now have now kind of gone on to have their own children and they're kind of thriving a little bit more that work with communities locally in Rwanda has, has really helped that population to thrive and so so much of it is it is retrievable, isn't it? We, I think it was said so many times within that program, and we say it so many times when we're talking about our work with Birds of Prey, all of these problems, these declines that we're seeing, we have, as a species, got the power to fix these things if we kind of set our minds to it, but it means a massive change of culture for us, doesn't it? I mean, it, we've got to completely change our way of thinking. I mean, it really does, yeah. I think that that population was down to i don't know a really small number of individuals but now it's approaching 1000 is that 250 individuals left um and by the time that documentary was made over over a thousand mountain gorillas yeah which is really nice so we should mention that the single biggest driver of biodiversity loss is habitat destruction so they did touch on all the different things that are causing um the biodiversity loss and habitat destruction is the big one Um, and climate change as well is obviously something we really need to think about. Um, Climate change, so it really does baffle me that people still deny climate change. 97% of scientists believe, and I hate the word believe because it's facts, it's not a belief. Well, it's the same in as it being a theory, change. isn't it? Which yeah. is it? I think people misunderstand the, the word. They of... misunderstand the word theory, exactly. So it's fact as we know it now. It's not that the scientists believe in it. It is actual fact based on evidence and lots of science and lots of work that they've done. And it really just completely baffles me that people still manage to deny climate change because you can see it. Look at all those wildfires in California in the past few weeks. Um, Erratic weather, even in this country, in the UK, which has the most bland weather (laughs) that you can think of. It's been having really erratic weather and I've noticed it just probably to have changed in my adulthood, since my childhood, Mm. that the weather in the UK has been more erratic. I mean, I couldn't really finish talking about this without mentioning... Um, David Attenborough's last words oh, within no. the program. <laughs> <laughs> Almost as bad as seeing the last two northern white rhinos yeah. there and somebody saying, you know, this is the last of a species. Uh, was David Attenborough kind of imploring us all to do something about it and kind of uh, referencing his own mortality? Yeah. As he gets hold, he's been around for all of us, hasn't he? Throughout or our love of natural history, he's always been there. Oh, he's such a figure, isn't he? He's such a figurehead in the whole natural history thing 
he's like the person i think the, one of the most influential people in natural history definitely definitely and for Ever. him to say you, you really need to do this even if not i'm not around to see it anymore yeah I mean, it's that that classic thing of old men planting trees the shade of which they'll never know he really oh, is yeah. trying to um you know trying to impart as much knowledge and as much kind of empathy for the natural world as he can um but i mean surely we can find a way to to keep him going forever Can't yeah we? we need to keep him around we're gonna need him cryogenically freezing maybe <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it'd be alongside Walt Disney <laughs> We wanted to delve a little deeper into what it's like to be a young person who loves nature today. So, Tom, you've been chatting to someone, haven't you? I certainly have. Um, I met up with up-and-coming nature enthusiast and wildlife broadcaster Indy Green, who told me all about his love for nature and how he hopes to inspire that passion in others. So, Indy, thank you so much for agreeing to come along and be on our podcast. You're actually the first... Uh, guests that we've had on our podcast prior to this it's just been Hannah and I babbling away to each other <laughs> so thank you so much for taking some time out to to talk to us thanks for having me now we wanted to kind of catch up with you really because this episode is all about um, young people getting involved with uh, wildlife conservation and really we wanted to kind of get to know you a little bit as well because I mean I first came across you when the bearded vulture video came up on uh, social media and you got to see one of my bucket list birds the bearded vulture how was that oh that was just of oh, the most epic wildlife counter at least of 2020 if not my entire life i were left uh, my house at i think it was well it was supposed to be 4 a.m because i got a message from a friend saying hey i've heard this bearded vulture there do you want to come and do you want to have a lift and i'll take you up there um and i said yeah cool and he, i said what time picking me up and he said probably around four um, and I was like, okay, right, I'll get some sleep now then. And he actually said, well, I've heard the parking's quite bad. I'll pick you up at three. Um, and I was like, okay, right, I'm in bed now. I'm going to sleep. And he said, well, actually, I've heard the parking's really, really bad. I'll pick you up at two. And I just said, if you're staying up all night and I'm staying up all night, why don't we just leave at one? <laughs> so he picked me up at one. And um, yeah, we left and it was a, kind of a two hour trek over this really sort of hilly moorland. It felt like it went on forever and we were sinking up to our waist in bogs, but then we finally got there. Um, and there were, we just expected a couple of birders on this ridge, but there were over 300 birders, all with their scopes and cameras and binoculars, staring down at this ridge. And of course, the vulture was there. And it was just incredible. I think us, a friend of mine described it as something straight out of the Jungle Book, um, which is really, which is just a superb description. But um, we waited five hours for it to take flight. And then it took off um, and it landed on a rock about five meters away from the roost site. And we thought, well, it's a bit undramatic. Um, but then it flew um, underneath us in the valley and then rose to be eye level with us and then started circling around 10 metres above our head and then just glide and then just glided straight over the moors behind us. And it was just insane. It was just insane. It sounds incredible. I mean, I, I am insanely jealous, I have to say. It's just one of those birds. <laughs> You're not the only one, I, mean, I can tell it's... you that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I'm not. I mean, did, did you kind of get a sense yeah. of the size of this bird as well? Because they're not small, are they? Well, no, that's especially why we hung around for the five hours to, to, to watch it take flight. Because this, you know, this species, the wingspan is almost, you know, over three metres. The probably biggest bird we've got in the UK at the moment. Um, bigger than the white-tailed eagle, in fact. So it was just, we had to experience that and just see that because that was partly why we came. Yeah. And how wonderful that so many people were getting excited about a species of vulture. You know, we talk an awful lot at the Trust about vultures you know, they kind of demonise a little bit and a lot of people don't like them for one reason or another. But having all of these people getting really excited about a vulture, that's, that's really good news, isn't it? Yeah, it's really good. And also especially because um, cause the vulture is on a grouse moor at the moment and it is a bit of danger of, you know, potentially getting shot or finding a stink pit with loads of dead animals that have been, you know, shot by lead. And if it finds one of them, then it's in big trouble indeed. So the fact that so many people have actually connected with the vulture and are still going up to see it is really handy because then they keep an eye on it. Um, they keep an eye on it for us, for the people and the wardens who can't get up there all the time. So having so many people, um, and not just birders, you know, families and just, you know, people who aren't necessarily big birders, they're just going there 
and they're connecting with this bird so it's really good and people hopefully people continue to do that and then um hopefully it will stay safe yeah absolutely and hopefully it'll stay safe from those people as well because i think sometimes in people's enthusiasm everybody rushing over there is this want and and um desire for people to get closer and closer to wildlife isn't it absolutely. and it's always important to keep that that safe distance back so they feel comfortable and relaxed but um absolutely. yeah it's always nice when you have to you have to ask people to um kind of um curb their enthusiasm rather than having yeah. to fire people up you're pulling them back i always mm. i think that's a much better position to be in yeah absolutely so that's obviously a a, a highlight really for well, for anybody's birding career, but just in general with, with wildlife moments, give, a, give us an idea of some of your sort of favourite wildlife moments. Oh, that's a good question. I suppose um, one that was pretty cool. Now, I live right next to Sherwood Forest, so I get some, if I don't say, if I do say so myself, some pretty awesome birds in the garden. And um, I was having breakfast um, in the garden one morning, it was about nine o'clock, um, and I heard some crossbills flying in the tree behind me and I thought, what on earth are they doing here? We haven't had crossbills here all year. And then um, I just heard some flying in the tree, literally about 10 metres from where I was sat. And I thought, I wonder if they're thirsty. Now, I've got a pool that I keep topped up all year round full of water that's just around the corner. And I thought, I wonder if they're thirsty. So I went down there. I've got a little hide set up. Um, and I sat in there with my camera and I waited for about two hours and I could still hear them up in the tree next to me. And I thought, well, oh, I'm not missing this if because I know the second I get out, they'll go straight down and I missed it. That's how a lot of wildlife encounters work. And I'm sure you know that, too. So I um, yeah waited around and then they all came down and it was there was a juvenile as well. So we didn't actually realize they bred in Nottinghamshire this year. But the fact that they did um, and now they're in my garden was um, up there with the vulture, I'd say. Yeah, <laughs> they came <laughs> yeah. to the right garden. <laughs> they did. I'm very glad they did. <laughs> that sounds awesome. I mean, I think some of my favourite wildlife moments are not not always necessarily with kind of particularly um, exotic species. So um, I spoke on the first episode about having never seen a badger. And and since, I mean, that was only like a few weeks ago. And since we've kind of sat on a, a footpath in the evening, my long-suffering partner and I have just sat there and we thought, right, we're going to just stake you out <laughs> here. So we're, we're probably... I don't know, 20 metres away from where we where we know that we've captured them on the, the camera trap. And I've still, to this day, only seen like a, a glimpse of one in the in the bushes and trees. But I went home on a high that evening just to have that kind of close proximity to a wild animal. Um, is it, is really, really amazing. But yeah, if they're coming into your own garden, so much the better, really. Absolutely, yeah. I think especially over lockdown, so many, just millions of people have connected with nature in their gardens and on their patch and everything, or even, you know, from their windows or balconies or whatever. Um, just having that, you know, nature to fall back on wherever you live, wherever you are, whatever your situation has been a lifesaver for a lot of people and um, badges is yours. <laughs> I think, as you said, more and more people are getting involved with um, wildlife or at least they're starting to think about it perhaps in a different way we're perhaps valuing it a little bit more than we might have done uh, when we were kind of free to move about the country agreed um, and I think you know organizations like uh, butterfly conservation and when the RSPB did the uh, the big garden bird watch things like that lots of people were well more people I think than ever before were getting involved with those sort of studies which is you know it's awesome news for, for wildlife it's got to be hasn't it Definitely. Yeah. And I think because so many people have learned about nature and I've, you know, I've seen so many people saying just, you know, like, again, like non birders, um, now wildlife lovers and stuff like, you know, like, aren't other birds louder this year and stuff like I, I didn't know I had this in my village. I didn't know I had that. So I think um, for a benefit for conservation and kind of surveys uh, now, not now more people know about, um, you know, nature in their local patch and, you know, how they're potentially declining, I think will um well, you know, help conservation. A lot of those people will think, well, you know, maybe I'll try and do something, you know, do the survey, butterfly count, whatever, bug a big garden bird watch. I think a lot of people will now, um, you know, that that switch is turned on and thought, you know, I'll help out now. Let's hope so. Um, so you spoke about having the crossfields come into the garden. Um, you're a wildlife photographer as well, aren't you? As well as being a naturalist and a, a wildlife enthusiast, you take photographs, which animals do you enjoy photographing the most 
Um, ah, yeah. Um, yes, got it. So, I've, oh gosh, I'm really trying to find a good answer, but I think um, on my patch in Sherwood Forest, we've got uh, probably the biggest red start population in Nottinghamshire, and we get about probably 15 pairs each year. Um, and this year wasn't a great year for them, unfortunately. We're not too sure why, still trying to figure that out. Um, but we did still find um, quite a few territories in the forest, despite lockdown and not being able to do many surveys. But I was out just over a month ago, and it was quite a late nest, but I found it out in the rain on my birthday, actually, with two friends walking around. And there was this red start nest, and there were it was in this tiny little birch tree with a tiny little crack in the middle. And there were maybe three or four chicks inside, and they were just constantly coming back with just food all the time. Like, what was it? Scorpion flies, silver wine moths, earwigs, longhorn beetles. It was just a complete biodiverse of just dead stuff in the in the beaks of these red starts for the jicks. But it was just... Um, and I was sat maybe five metres away from them with my camera. Um, and they were just happily coming in and out. Like, I think I counted 16 times in one minute. Um, collectively from both adults, which is a pretty wow. outstanding feeding rate. So I was super impressed by them. And also, for those of you who've seen Red Starts, they are just stunning. They're kind of like, they're kind of robin size. Um, the male has got a really bright orange red chest, um, kind of little black and white cap, and then sort of brownie back. And just the female kind of looks a bit like a robin actually, but it's kind of a reddish orange all the way around, a nice little golden brown beak. And they are just... Oh, they're just exquisite birds. Absolutely brilliant. Mm. And I'm dead impressed with that rate of feeding the youngsters. I mean, I'm always impressed with things like, you know, barn owls and kestrels, them bringing back food to the nest. You know, maybe the individual barn owls, maybe even eating five, six voles in a day, and maybe they've got three or four hungry mouths to feed in that, that nest site as well. But um, yeah, how many times did you say in a minute? Yeah, 16 was the best one, but there was two nests that I monitored. 16 times a yeah, minute? Yeah, there was two nests that I monitored, and the first nest that I was um, that I was shown was 19 times a minute. So, yeah. Wow. I, I, I don't even like... That's some going. It's funny, like, when you're out in the forest, you just you find I'm always looking for beetles and insects and stuff, and I'm just like, okay, right, unsuccessful again. And they're just finding... I know they're birds, and they're, you know, it's, you know really clever in there. You know, finding all these insects. And that's all they've got but, to think about. Yeah, well, that's really. all they got. That's all they focus on. Whereas I'm sort of looking for the birds and the insects at the same time. But and they're just like insects only. So it's just oh, all the focus is on them, and they have done a fantastic job. So how much of your kind of uh, finding these uh, wildlife moments? How much of that is just something that you're out and about anyway, and you stumble across, you know, whatever it might be. And how much is you actively going and looking for things? So I'm always out, um, usually pretty much every weekend. Um, well, I was out this morning, actually, uh, since 5 a.m. A bit of a weirdo, but anyway. Um, I was out since 5 a.m. And I was just, you know, I found a spot of fly catch a nest this morning in the forest, which was really nice. So a lot of the stuff I do find um, by myself because, you know, I, I know I know it well now and I've been here quite a long time. So, um, but... Uh, there is a great kind of birding community here. I'm the only one who really is in Sherwood Forest like all the time. Um, but there are quite a few other people who've, you know, I contact quite frequently and saying, you know, what you got, anything exciting. And um, yeah, we always communicate. We're always telling each other what we found. And it's, um, it's a nice community to be part of. Everyone's pretty pleasant. And um, yeah, it's, it's really nice to share knowledge and news only of the stuff that's not too sensitive <laughs> but yeah yeah, yeah of course because yeah. you've you've kind of once you find things you've almost got that um responsibility to protect it also haven't you because you don't want that information you know for for everybody to suddenly flood in go and try and find that wildlife or potentially try to damage it in any way so you're almost become a custodian uh, uh to to protect that that individual absolutely yeah and i i can't well, and I won't say where this is, but I um, I was told about a little family of long-eared owls that I kind of um, followed from a pretty discreet distance, really far away from on a track um, somewhere in Nottinghamshire. I'm not saying where. And um, and I was. I think that's vague enough. I think that's vague enough. enough. Yeah. So in, <laughs> somewhere in Nottinghamshire. <laughs> yeah. Good luck if you do. Um, I'll be impressed. I'll give you ten pounds. Anyway. Um, but I was reading a case just a couple of weeks ago that genuinely upset me, and it was in it was in Derbyshire, and there was this well-known long-eared owl site, um, 
and unfortunately it got that well known that a lot of pretty irresponsible photographers were getting right underneath the net, um, the right underneath the roof site, sorry. And there were maybe three or four chicks I heard. I, I don't know the full details of this case. Um, but eventually there were so many photographers there that the adults couldn't come in and feed the chicks as often as they would like to. And eventually the chick got weaker and weaker and it came kind of fell further down the tree and eventually it was found dead underneath the roof site. Um, so I really made sure, especially after that, to just keep my distance from the ones that I knew about because I did not want a repeat of that because long-eared owls are steeply declining like a lot of other species. So when photographing birds, especially sensitive species, it is so incredibly important to just be responsible and respectful. So that's my message. Yeah, here, 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 here. Let's move on just a little bit then. Um, you've obviously seen a whole host of wildlife uh, so far. Is there anything that you've not seen that you would put a massive tick against on your bucket list uh, if you spotted it tomorrow? Oh, gosh. Um, I... Da, 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 da. I would love to see... So there's a bird called a redneck farallope, and they do breed, I believe, in like Shetland and Orkney. And I think the Isle of Lewis as well, kind of the outer um, eastern and western Hebrides. And I would just love to see them in full summer plumage because I've seen a few down in Nottinghamshire and in the Netherlands. And they're kind of, they're in the wintry plumage and they're kind of all grey and black. And um, I've seen some of the photos um, on social media over the summer of some birds up in Shetland. And I think it was on Lewis as well. And they are just stunning. They are, they're, they're a weird little bird. They're kind of a little sort of like wading slash duck bird, but I, think, I do believe they are a wader. They sound, they sound fantastic. I, I'm kind of imagining, because I'm not sure I'm familiar with them, but um, I'm imagining from what you've said. Well, look them up because they, they are... something are, really quite yeah, special. Look them up because they are just brilliant. You'll just you'll start dribbling when you look them up, honestly. They're just brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we sort of talk an awful lot about uh, wildlife and our impact on wildlife and how we can start to change behaviours to make the future for wildlife a little bit brighter. And we spend so much of our time doing this on social media. And one of the ways that I first kind of found out about you and your passion for wildlife, particularly on your local patch, was through the self-isolating bird club that's been going on throughout um, lockdown. Uh, what was it like to kind of be found a little bit by that and then kind of thrust in front of its thousands upon thousands of followers yeah that was that was quite an experience actually because i remember at the beginning of lockdown i thought oh this is going to be a drag um as i'm sure many other people thought and still think um but then i just got this call from a friend of mine lucy and she said hey do you want to um make a film for this um you know self i think bird club hosted by chris packer and megan mccubbin and i was like Yes, <laughs> I was just, you can't I turn was, that down, really. Well, you can't, you? You, like who wouldn't? Like it's oh, it was just like I was. I think I was dancing around for quite a long time after that phone call, so I was pretty happy about that. Um, and then I made it. I made my first one about lesser spotted woodpeckers, um, and that is probably still my favourite. I've got another one in the pipeline at the moment, which you'll hopefully get to see in the next month or so. Um, but that one I filmed all by myself. I had literally no help with it. And it was less spots of one of my favorite birds. And that was like deep in lockdown. So obviously I was only allowed out for you know, an hour a day. So trying to cram all that filming in, trying to get all the footage and everything I had to say and long pieces about lesser spots was pretty difficult, but it got some really nice reception. And I was just so honored to be on that show. It was so brilliant to kind of watch you and kind of enjoy your enthusiasm and and feel your enthusiasm alongside you because I think so often um, our world kind of almost demonises young people as being um, kind of apathetic about wildlife and about nature. Do you think young people are interested in wildlife? I think it's a growing kind of trend or, you know, kind of nerdiness and popularity in wildlife and nature. But I was having a really interesting chat the other day um, that I think climate change, like the climate change crisis and all the um, strikes, especially, you know, all around the globe, all around the globe, really. Um, I think that's really taken hold of a lot of young people who sort of think, well, not just is everyone else doing this, so I might join in, 
but also they have, I think, grown to realise that it is for an incredibly important cause, you know, the future of the planet and everyone else. This is like the Greta Thunberg effect. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, the Thunberg effect. So I think a lot of people have, you know, gotten behind her and gotten behind each other, um, and you know, to support the crisis. So I think it is... It is it is a slow movement. I remember a couple of years ago, um, I was just sort of sitting here on social media just looking and there were just, um, no, I don't mean to offend anyone, but there were just old birders posting pictures of, you know, you know, really good pictures. Um, and I just thought, okay, this is just how it's going to be. And I just thought, well, I'm the only one here. Um, and then a, f a friend of mine um, suggested a couple of accounts for me to follow to say, Ray, look, there are actually some good young people out there. And I was like, whoa, there's loads. And um, yeah, I found all, you know, all these incredible people on social media and I just thought, OK, right, we, we might be on something here then. This could be, you know, it might not be as bad as I initially thought. So I think it is a growing, uh, kind of like a growing sort of trend in young people to be interested in wildlife and nature. I think there's still a bit of a gap where it's sort of um, sort of frowned, well, not frowned upon, but sort of looked upon weirdly if you can, you know, get nerdy about a certain topic, beetles, bugs, bees, whatever. So I don't think it, it's still a little bit of a gap that's just got to be educated to say, actually, um, you can be interested in it. If you're interested in, I don't know, football, computer games, whatever it is, then I can be interested about this. I am. And I'm going to stay like that. Yeah, I think everybody's nerdy about something, aren't they? Some, everybody, oh, yeah. Everybody's got an interest in something and they want to tell other people about it. It's interesting you said about how it was nice to connect with other young people through social media because maybe that is in itself part of the spark that, that triggers that inspiration for other people because the generation before just didn't have that. So to have this constant update from different people um, all around the country, all around the world, um, who have got this same love and, and passion as you have, that's kind of inspiring in itself. And hopefully that might you know, sort of emanate outwards to more and more people. Absolutely, let's fingers crossed. So how d how did it begin for you then? When did you know that you'd kind of gotten the bug and you were definitely going to be interested in bugs and beetles and birds and you're not going to be interested in so much perhaps football and computer games? How did you know that was for you? Oh, I I mean I live pretty much in the middle of the woods and I'm just, you know like I said in my patch of Sherwood forest so I was pretty much always out there and I was a well even more of a kid and I am now I'm only 15 <laughs> but yeah I was always always out there and I've you know the forest was my playground and I've lived there all my life so um it's I just couldn't really help but fall in love with it really and just having um you know we've got a decent sized garden you know nice bit a nice little pond we've got recently um the last couple of years and of course the pool has kept me entertained but I can still remember um when I went into the shop and I brought my first bird feeder and I just thought, oh, okay, this is going to be fun. And I had, you know, kind of like one of those little kind of plastic sort of toy castles that you can sort of get in the garden just to, you know, mess around with. And I had that and I was in the, um, I don't I don't know what you call it, like the, um, like, you know, like the crown. Not, not, it looks like a crown, but it's almost like that sort of circular. Um, like a turret. That, that's it. Yeah, the turret. That's it. That's it. And I've got one of those, a little one of those. And I used to sit in there with my umbrella on a notebook. And um, I think I had some tiny little, maybe tiny little binoculars. And I just remember just, you know, watching that feeder. And then I got two, three, four, five. And now I've got a lot more than five. So, yeah, it, it just went from there. Really. And a number of them. A number, a, I won't say because you'll, I, anyone would laugh. But yeah, I've, got, I've got quite a few feeders. <laughs> it sounds like you're single-handedly feeding the entire population <laughs> yes. around you yeah well that's, that's why they're here, not Sherwood Forest because of the feeders <laughs> so how do we think we can get more young people kind of inspired by this sort of thing from a, a young age is there anything that maybe could change about our education systems what, what do you think could be done well actually um, only recently just a couple of days ago I found out that I might be able to just in a small way contribute to educating young people towards nature directly because I got asked to do um, kind of like a you know an online talk for a group of year one children at my local school about all the ancient oak trees in Sherwood Forest so I thought awesome thanks for that <laughs> nice I'm gonna have them because um, it's always good to get kids interested in a young age because I think I don't know a toddler 
who doesn't love jumping in a puddle just for the sake of it. I don't know if you've ever met one. I doubt you have. So I think there's all, every, every young child, I know I did especially, all has that sense of wild in them when they're young. But I think that's almost scrubbed out of them when they get into kind of school because there is the, you know, that regime. You only really get to go outside when you get home early in the morning or the weekend. So there's not much time out of nature. Any other time we've got free spent doing I won't use another word, but homework. Um, so <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I still have to do it. Very, very important. <laughs> very important. I won't put another word in front of it. Let's just call it homework. So <laughs> I, um, and I just think, I just think, well, like I was saying earlier, it's almost not cool to be interested in nature sometimes. But I think, like I said earlier as well, it's kind of that growing trend of people who think, oh, actually, forget it, I'm doing it. I'm, I'm gonna, I love nature, so I'm gonna keep with it. I don't care what anyone else thinks of me, don't care what anyone else says. Um, so I think it is a growing popularity in that, but I think um, kind of encouraging people to do that at a young age, like I'm hopefully going to be doing with these school kids very soon is one of the ways, best ways forward. Hmm. I th well, I think in many ways, you'll already be doing that through the things you've already done. And I mean, it's, it's a massive um, kind of testament to your yourself and your own character to be able to take that back step and to say, no, this is something that I'm interested in and tough luck if you don't like it. And I think there's an awful lot of um, mm. lot of people that love to have that quality about themselves. Uh, did you kind of feel, or well, do you continue to s kind of still feel that backlash from, you know, people at school or other people in your life that kind of think, oh, that's that's a little bit odd, that's a little bit nerdy. You know, I don't agree with you doing that. I mean, thankfully, uh, well, thankfully, I am now um, homeschooled, actually, so I don't really have any of that anymore. Um, so the only real friends I have, the few of them I do have, <laughs> the only real friends I have, they, uh, they kind of, you know, they're all interested in nature and I've kind of not selected them like on a, you know, an aisle, but, you know, I've, you know, I've got a quite a cool, you know, quite a cool friends list and they're, um, they're all really interested in nature and it's great getting to know them and learning from each other, which is really awesome. So I... I did used to have that. Um, it wasn't on a huge scale, and like I know a lot of kids have had it um, after speaking to some of my friends, but I did, um, whether it was primary or secondary school, but it was just, I was always sort of, what, what are you looking at, what are you doing? Uh, okay, that's weird, that's weird. Right, that's strange, you're weird. Um, so I was like, well, I'm not really bothered what you think because I you're not involved in my life. I barely know who you are, so please leave me alone. <laughs> so yeah, yeah that was that was my hobby, and I just stuck with it, and I'm glad I did. And look where you are now, even so much the better. <laughs> so, <laughs> Indy, what what happens from here? Because you're kind of already being uh, featured on the uh, self isolating bird club. You've got your own uh, Instagram accounts and Twitter accounts, and you're already you know producing some fabulous photography and and as you said already kind of teaching the next generation where do you see yourself going with this um I mean, there's so many different ways um I, I, I just like you'll never accept it's an except if it's a job interview you'll never ever see me in a suit and tie at an event indoors ever i'm saying that now i'm making a stand that if 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 you know if you see me that then something has gone drastically wrong. So I just, I something outside I will definitely take. So um, I think, well, I do a lot of volunteering with the RSPB and the Wildlife Trust and the BTO at the moment. And, um, and we've started back up again, which is great. And I do a lot of practical volunteering. Um, I was out there just a couple of days ago, did a three day run in Sherwood Forest, um, doing a bit of scrub removal, getting rid of some bracken, trying to open up a little wet area so we can get some more rare species of ferns in and more grasses and heather. Um, and we found one of the only places you can find striped between grasshopper in Nottinghamshire, which is in Sherwood Forest, which is very cool. I'm very pleased with that. Um, so just anything outside, I've got, I'm sort of getting to know a couple more people um, who could sort of help me out with advice and everything. So just chatting to them because I do love all the photography and filmmaking side of things, but I do also love kind of like the social media side of things and sort of the um, communications and that sort of thing. But then I do also love the practical work and like the managing and the reserve kind of stuff. So I am split very much three ways at the moment, but thankfully I've still got 
a couple of years, dwindling years, but I've got a couple of years to think about it. <laughs> You've got plenty of time behind you, that's for sure. Yeah. And it sounds like you, whatever comes up, it will probably be quite varied, really. I, There's not yeah. going to be the daily grind to go to by the sounds of things. Find a job you love and you'll never work again. Or something like Absolutely. that. Absolutely. <laughs> Just like me and Hannah on Nature's a Hoot. We love yes. our job. That's why we're here. We love what we do. <laughs> yes, there we are. So if there's other young people listening to this, what advice would you offer to those other young aspiring naturalists? Ooh, so I think if you're already interested in nature and you know that's something you want to keep at, then simply keep at it. If you're still at school, you know, if you're in primary school or secondary school or, you know, any age, um, just ignore what anyone else says, providing it's not encouragement. Um, so it's just it's just following, you know, it's just like everyone says, you know, do what you love and just don't give up. And I know that sounds extremely cheesy, but all those commercials and all those things you see on the bottom of coffee cups or whatever they are, they are true. So it is they are and they are right as well so just keep at it and if you want more ways to encourage wildlife into your garden to get it close to you do things like get a pond or plant a mini wildflower meadow just don't give up because the planet depends on you absolutely does get that message in there Indy. we need more and more people to be saving our planet looking after it learning a bit more about it um indy it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you thank you so much for being our first outside guest on Nature's a Hoot. Uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of people listening of all ages that'll be very inspired by everything you've got to offer. And after this goes out, we'll um, we'll kind of put some links to your accounts and things like that. So if people want to kind of follow what you're doing and uh, and have a look at what you're getting up to, then they can do it from, from those streams, I guess. Lovely. Thank you. And thank you very much for having me. It was really good fun. It was great to spend some time with Indy, who actually came to visit us for the first time in August. And I reckon he could go far. Watch out, Springwatch presenters. Yes, it was. It was great to meet Indy. He definitely has a lot of potential and a very passionate about wildlife. Now it's time for our top tip. This month, plant your own mini wildflower meadow. Increasing the diversity of native wildflowers in your garden is one of the best ways to help wildlife, and early autumn is the time to get started. Most wildflowers release their seeds in late summer and early autumn, so it makes sense to sow the seeds and to keep the natural order of things. Plus, the grass is starting to slow down its growth, giving the wildflowers a chance to get started. Wild red poppies and cornfield seeds are some of the best to start at this time. You could also sow yellow rattle, which is semi-parasitic on the grass. It feeds off the nutrients in the grass roots, keeping that in check and giving other wildflower species more of a chance to grow. First, you need to pick your spot. It wants to be moist but not too wet, and somewhere where there'll be plenty of sunlight. Clear the soil of grass or weeds, then rake it so it's as level as possible, breaking down any lumps that might stop the seedlings from pushing through. Sprinkle the seeds evenly across the ground and then rake it over gently. Next, give the seeds a good watering and then stop. They'll likely not need another watering until the spring. Finally, good luck. Let us know how you get on with planting your very own mini wildflower meadow. So that's it for this month, but remember you can always find out more by reading our blog that accompanies each episode or by following us on social media and just a reminder we are at Hawk Conservancy on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook and YouTube. Next time we'll be chatting all about the link between wildlife and well-being and some of the studies that we've been part of looking into how beneficial time in the wild really can be for our mental health. Be sure to join us for that. Once again thanks for listening and we'll be back on the 1st of November. Bye. Bye.